Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Father Mark Bosco, Vice President of, for Mission and Ministry here at Georgetown University. Welcome to Dahlgren Chapel of the Sacred Heart, the spiritual heart of our Georgetown community. In this sacred space, generations of students, faculty, staff, and alumni have encountered God in the sacraments, in prayer, and in communal reflection. In the spirit of our Jesuit and Catholic heritage, we profess here our deep respect and our sincere appreciation for people of other backgrounds who also seek to grow in faith and knowledge. Georgetown's Jesuit tradition of education has always prized both the pursuit of truth and the development of virtue. It is the transformation of the whole person from ignorance to understanding, from isolation to dialogue, from indifference to moral responsibility that characterizes the best of what a Jesuit education like Georgetown has to offer. So much of our political and social discourse in our nation has hardened. It has distracted us from our ability to have an informed, honest, even prophetic dialogue about the ethical issues facing us today. With these Dahlgren dialogues, we hope that a conversation in the midst of this sacred space might offer a more prayerful posture to engage political, academic, and spiritual leaders. Framing these dialogues within a place of prayer and worship can sustain and empower us to be more active participants and renew our common sense of purpose. Today, the Office of Mission and Ministry, in collaboration with the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought, continues the series of conversations around social justice in light of our rich and deep theological heritage. Today, we share our thoughts, reflections, and prayers on sharing the journey with immigrants and refugees. We are so pleased to have Cardinal Joseph Tobin as our featured panelist today. As this is prayer, I'd like to invite Georgetown's interfaith chaplain, Imam Yahya Hendi, to begin this evening's Dahlgren Dialogue in prayer. A reading from the Holy Quran. والذين تبوأوا الدار والإيمان من قبلهم يحبون من هاجر إليهم ولا يجدون في صدورهم حاجة مما أوتوا. But those who before them had homes in the city and had adopted the faith, they show their affection and love to those who emigrate to them and to those who flee unto them for refuge. They entertain no desire in their hearts for things given to the immigrants, but give them preference over themselves, even though they are in hardship and adversity. Let us all pray. Compassionate God, you want us to open our shores and homes to those who escape tyranny poverty, torture, violence, and war. Compassionate God, guide us to welcome immigrants with pleasure, generosity, and delight, to share our wealth with them as you share your love with us all, to open our eyes so that we can see you in the eyes of our immigrant communities whose eyes are saddened for having resided for a long time in the shadows. Compassionate God, the God of justice, who transcends all borders and all boundaries, give us audacity, audacity, the courage, and the strength to challenge, to say no to all unfair laws. Give us the strength to stand with and for a kingdom of radical love and radical justice, justice for all. 
Let us all with a united voice say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Imam. I now invite Dr. John J. DeJoya, President of Georgetown University, to come forward to introduce our distinguished guest and panelists and to set the tone for our dialogue. Well, thank you very much, Father Bosco, for your exceptional leadership of our Office of Campus Ministry. And it's an honor to be here with all of you. A good afternoon. It's, it's a privilege to welcome all of you for our third Dahlgren Dialogue hosted by our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life and our Office of Mission and Ministry. These dialogues offer an opportunity for us to come together in prayer, reflection, and conversation on the intersection of faith and public life as we seek a deeper alignment of our values and our action. I'm pleased to have with us this, this afternoon Paul and Chan Tagliabu, who are both terrific leaders on our campus. Paul serves as vice chair of our board of directors. Chan is a member of our board of regents. And this afternoon, we will have the pleasure of hearing from two students, Ms. Rahim Belman Guerrero and Habon Ali, who will share their own reflections and experiences. Ms. Rahim and Habon, thank you for being a part of today's conversation. And finally, I wish to offer my gratitude to the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought, to John Carr, the Initiative Director, who will also moderate our session today, and to Father Bosco and the Office of Mission and Ministry for their efforts to make today's dialogue possible. Today's dialogue invites us to engage with a global campaign launched by His Holiness Pope Francis in September of 2017. This campaign called Share the Journey aims to inspire action among our global community and issues a call for us to stand in solidarity with migrants and refugees in our communities and around the world. This fall, we were honored to welcome Archbishop Silvano Tomasi to our campus to share his reflections on this call to action and his insights on the urgency of these issues and the role that each of us can play in support of and in solidarity of displaced people throughout our world. The Share the Journey project is animated by a commitment to a culture of encounter, an idea that has been prominent in the leadership of Pope Francis. A culture of encounter honors personal interaction and an attentiveness to our neighbor that in Pope Francis's words, quote, returns to each person their dignity as children of God, the dignity of living, close quote. He urges us as a global community to draw upon this connection, this encounter, to deepen our solidarity with our immigrant and refugee sisters and brothers. This call to solidarity is more urgent today than ever. For many years, our Georgetown community has advocated for the passage of the DREAM Act. And at this critical time, we continue to push for a permanent bipartisan solution to protect our dreamers. In the years since DACA was put in place, more and more of our young people with courage and conviction have helped to drive awareness of how the nation, our nation's immigration policies impact our neighbors and made it clear that we need to address seriously the framework for immigration in our country. This week, students continued to uplift the importance of these issues by organizing a day to dream that included advocacy and a social media campaign supporting our dreamers. These efforts and many others remind us that we must foster a national conversation that affirms the dignity of every immigrant, of every undocumented student, of every refugee, in order to ensure that we can, as a nation, fulfill our responsibilities to one another. There are few better suited to be here with us today to offer an example of what it means to commit ourselves to walking alongside our immigrant 
brothers and sisters, to embody a culture of encounter and care for our neighbors than Cardinal Tobin. For many years, he has been a strong and unwavering voice for those in our undocumented and immigrant communities. During his early pastoral work after seminary, when he was assigned to his childhood parish in Detroit, Cardinal Tobin helped to establish a center for political refugees seeking asylum. As Archbishop of Indianapolis, Cardinal Tobin advocated for Syrian refugees seeking sanctuary in the state of Indiana, providing resettlement services through Catholic charities. In October of 2016, His Holiness Pope Francis named Cardinal Tobin to the College of Cardinals and shortly after appointed him Archbishop of Newark. In this role, Cardinal Tobin continues his advocacy about the impact of immigration policies on our neighbors and on community members, even accompanying an individual facing deportation to his federal hearing. Through programs in the Newark Archdiocese, Cardinal Tobin has helped to resettle refugees from all over the world, and he continues to speak out about the executive orders impacting refugees and immigrants. He's a native of Detroit, the oldest of 13 children. Cardinal Tobin also served as Superior General of the Redemptorist Order for 12 years and as Secretary of the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life in the Vatican. Throughout his career, he has remained deeply committed to justice and to the dignity of all he serves. In an address in Brooklyn this past year, Cardinal Tobin called listeners to, in his words, quote, put a face on the faceless, to restore a human face to those whose faces have been distorted. In doing so, we show our face, not as a bunch of isolated individuals, but as a network of hope people who believe, and because of that belief, accept the bond of solidarity." Close quote. Cardinal Tobin's prophetic voice challenges us to be alive to this possibility of solidarity, to our responsibility for the common good, and calls us to respond with conviction to one of the most pressing political and social questions of our time. Your Eminence, we are deeply grateful for your, for your presence. We're honored to be able to share this afternoon with you. Cardinal Tobin will be joined in conversation by John Carr, the director of our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life, our moderator this afternoon. And after their dialogue, we will welcome Ms. Rahim and Habon to share their reflections and join the conversation. We have some seats on both sides. So as we, we move to this next stage, if some of you'd like to come in, there's room over here for those who are standing in the back. Please, this would be the moment to do it. <laughs> and as you do so, it's, my, it's truly an honor for me to welcome to our stage Cardinal Tobin in conversation with John Carr. Nothing like a full church. No, no. The, uh, well, this Dahlgren Dialogue, and I want to thank our partners uh, in Mission and Ministry who have made this possible. Uh, it's our third. Brings together a community that cares and stands in solidarity, not only with the members of our community who are immigrants and refugees, but well beyond that. It brings together a pastor who leads not only with words, but with example, accompanying immigrants and refugees and standing with them in times of fear, and with students who are examples of the very dignity we seek to protect. It is the right place, the right topic, and a very urgent time. Since Dr. DeJoya introduced you with 
uh, all those impressive credentials, I have a different question. How does a kid from Detroit, the oldest of 13, end up a redemptorist at the Vatican, Indianapolis, and then a cardinal in Newark? Well, I appreciate the question because I was getting a little squeamish in my seat as Dr. DeJoya was speaking. I felt like the widow at the, uh, her husband's funeral said, uh, <laughs> hearing the priest uh, preach a, a glowing elegy, uh, eulogy, open the casket, see who's in there. You know? <laughs> uh, I suppose part of it was the circumstances of my birth. I mean, I'm, I'm the grandson of immigrants. And uh, my uh, grandmother, who uh, came from a, an important part of Europe called County Kerry, uh, and scrubbed floors in a Boston hospital so she could s send her kids to school. She uh, always spoke English well, uh, sometimes too well. You know? She used to say to me, Joseph, uh, I never figured you for a priest. <laughs> but I guess it's better than honest work. <laughs> I noticed, though, when she prayed by herself, she prayed in Irish. And I asked her once, and she indicated she wasn't quite sure that God understood English. <laughs> so We're already in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that, uh, you know, growing up with, with that connection to another country and realizing what brought her to the United States. Because my, my dad and my uncles never had a whole lot of money, but they would often to offer to pay her way back to see her sisters in Ireland. And she would dismiss them, saying, all I knew there was poverty. You go back. Finally, she went back when she was 75 and complained that everything had changed. <laughs> <laughs> I was fortunate to be born in a sort of a working class neighborhood of Detroit that was a gateway for immigrants. So I grew up with kids that um, went home and spoke a different language, they ate different kinds of food, and uh, oftentimes a lot more interesting than some of the food that we had because you know, the three qualities for Irish cooking is put something in water, boil it, and take it out. Um, <laughs> they spoke a different language at home, and I was curious about that. And uh, then I, I think what motivated me to join uh, the Redemptress was the, the sense that they wanted to stand with people sort of on the other side of, track, of the tracks. And I, I continued on that uh, trajectory, but during my formation, spending summers working with migrants and migrant camps, you know, and getting to know a little bit about their lives. And as a young priest, uh, being sent back to that home parish, which at one time, I think, was the largest or organized English-speaking parish in the world. We had 14 masses on Sunday when I was a kid and about 20,000 people. When I returned, it was neither organized nor English-speaking. Um, <laughs> and we had mass in every uh, Sunday in English, Spanish, and Arabic. And it was getting to know their reality, working as an organizer for the United Farm Workers, um, in Detroit. And then uh, Dr. DeJoya mentioned the, the work during the terrible civil wars um, of the 1980s in Central America, that people from our neighborhood were being deported and then killed when they returned to Salvador or Honduras. So all of that conspired to, uh, to open my eyes to the reality of this people. Mm -hmm. You were at the Vatican, uh, you came home. Uh, clearly those experiences drove your ministry. Not every archbishop takes on a governor who wants to restrict uh, refugees. Not every cardinal accompanies immigrants to deportation hearings. Where does the passion come from? Why is this a religious issue, an issue? Of, why are we in the chapel instead of a lecture hall as we discuss this? Well, I think from you know, a, a Christian standpoint, 
if you dig down deep enough in what we believe, we believe in the greatest migration that's been possible. I mean, it's, it's a scandalous migration for many that God leaves God's glory and becomes one of us. And then becomes a migrant. After his birth, he has to flee with his family to another country because there are people who want to kill him. And he returns and, and knows some of the, 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 the poverty and the sort of rootlessness that uh, led him to say, you know, the foxes have their, their dens and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Describing, the, I think, uh, the sort of mig migration that's at the root of our belief. We also stand in a Judeo-Christian uh, tradition that uh, admonished seriously the people of God to welcome the alien and to never mistreat them. And the motivation was, for you once were aliens. Hence the, um, the consternation when, when believing, good, good hearted believing people in this country Forget that, you know, that most, all, all of us except for Native Americans and the descendants of slaves came here to try and find something better. Mm -hmm. You share a lot of things with Pope Francis. Um, the, one of the things you share is this priority, this passion for migrants. Uh, you said earlier at a class uh, that you attended that uh, Pope Francis probably didn't have a lot of familiarity with immigration, but he has made this, uh, in some ways, the centerpiece of his leadership. Uh, he, he latched onto this very early. Why do you think it drives him as well as driving you? Well, maybe I could tell my favorite Pope Francis story. It's got to stay in this chapel, so I... <laughs> oh, that'll work. Yeah. The camera there, the red okay. light means... <laughs> it, maybe you've heard me tell it before because I'm so concerned about security, but uh, I have it on very good sources that shortly after Pope Francis was elected in uh, the spring of 2013, he contacted the Secretary of State of the Holy See a cardinal, and said, I want to go to Lampedusa. And now Lampedusa, you might know, is an island in the southern Mediterranean, part of the Italian national territory, but really much closer to Libya than it is to uh, the Italian, Italian mainland. Well, the cardinal tried to talk him out of it. He said, look, uh, this is your first trip. Uh, it's going to communicate a message. Maybe this isn't the message you want to communicate. And you just got elected. And maybe it's not the time to be traveling. So why don't you think about it? A week later, the Holy Father called again. And he said, uh, I want to go to Lampedusa. So the Cardinal could see he had his mind made up. And he said, OK, OK, fine. Uh, we'll go to Lampedusa. But these trips can't be arranged from one day to the next. It's logistics, it's media, it's security, maybe six months, possibly a year. The following week, the Cardinal received another phone call, but this time it wasn't from the Pope. It was from a vice president of Alitalia, which is the national uh, airline. And the vice president said, I think you people would want to know that a passenger by the name of Jorge Bergoglio <laughs> has booked a seat on the Rome-Lampedusa flight. <laughs> and then they moved. And by, by June of that year, 2013, so really about four months after his election, he was there. And what you asked me, John, I, uh, I thought about that incident, besides the charming stubbornness of the Holy Father, I asked myself, well, as the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, how much contact did you have with refugees or with um, uh, immigrants? Certainly there's, there's a portion of 
people that come from neighboring Latin American countries. But, and then I realized he was doing what in the, in the Catholic community, the Second Vatican Council instructed the church to do in so many, in many different ways, but I suppose most clearly in the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. And that was to read the signs of times and places in the light of faith. That's what, he, that's what convinced him. Because he realized that there's 65 million refugees in the strict sense of the UN's definition on the face of the earth today. And if you factor in the immigrants, it works out to be about one in every 42 people on the face of the earth. And so I think he saw that this had to be, this was laying on his heart and on the church the obligation to respond. You bring not only passion and experience, your, your grandmother, but uh, responsibility. As Archbishop of Indianapolis, uh, you got in a dialogue with the governor of Indiana, who along with a lot of other uh, governors, after a terrorist incident said, we're gonna ban refugees from a part of the world and Governor Pence said, not in Indiana. And you said, we have different responsibilities. Can you talk? I mean, that's not an easy thing to do, to take on the, the power of the state. Why did you do that? What did you say to him? Well, the Catholic Charities in the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, like Catholic Charities across the United States, has had a very successful track record in resettling refugees and helping them integrate into their new life and to accompany them as they, they go along. If you recall, I believe it was September of 2016, uh, 15, there were terrorist attacks in Paris and Belgium. And afterwards, about 31 United States governors said that they would accept no Syrian refugees in their jurisdictions, which even from a legal standpoint was questionable because the uh, once people were admitted to the United States by the federal government, they <coughs> could settle where they, uh, where they could. So I, I wanted to talk to Governor Pence and I brought along uh, the Director of Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese as well as a very talented uh, young woman who was in charge of the, the actual refugee resettlement program and a fourth person who was a young Iraqi refugee by the name of Ali. And Ali had had a degree in English and from the University of Baghdad. He uh, enjoyed talking, quoting Shakespeare. And he had just become an American citizen. So my intention was to say, this is what a refugee looks like. And this is what can happen to a refugee if you know, uh, they're, they're welcomed and accompanied in love. And he was very happy to explain to the governor of uh, all that he, he was doing and how much he loved his job as the coffee manager at the JW Marriott. If you're, next time you're in Indianapolis, ask for Ali, he'll give you a, a discount. Um, and so when I said to the governor, uh, we don't believe that, at first it's legal, and we certainly don't believe it's moral to arbitrarily ban people who have fled situations of incredible violence, who have lived in refugee camps for three years or more. The family we were, had in mind had been in a, a, a refugee camp in Jordan for three years, two and a half of which they had been extensively vetted by seven different federal agencies and we're ready to come. I mean, we were talking about the matter of a week or so. And he said, well, would you go home and pray about it? I said, I'll pray about it. And uh, then I phoned him and said we were gonna go ahead and he, there was some mention that funds would be not available. And I said, well, then I'll count on the community mm -hmm. to do it. And so we did. and. Uh, that family, that mom and dad and the two kids were welcomed. The mother had a sister already in Indianapolis that we had resettled. 
And uh, their biggest problem after about uh, six months was that the kids were waking up their mom and dad on Sunday thinking that they were going to miss school. They were so happy to be in a school and be learning things. So, yeah, that, that's what led to the conversation. That was not my experience as a parent. <laughs> uh, uh, you, the story you told, my, my little parish, there are a couple people from my parish here, has also been involved in welcoming a refugee family. And it's, uh, we're helping the refugee family, I hope, but it's helping us practice our faith. But I was really struck by the fact that while we were meeting downstairs to talk about this family, uh, upstairs at the noon mass were about 300 Latino Catholics many of whom were at risk of deportation. Here we focus on DACA, and we should, but there are many other immigrants who live in fear and uncertainty and are at risk because of the policies that are being advocated. Uh, you accompany one of those immigrants to a deportation hearing. W who was that? Why did you do that? How do we understand if people are here illegally, shouldn't they face the consequences? Well, about a, a year ago, I was contacted by friends and informed of uh, a gentleman by the name of Catalino Guerrero, who was a, uh, uh, born in Mexico, uh, 59 years old, a grandfather uh, with his wife, four kids, and a number of grandchildren in uh, New Jersey. Uh, as well as uh, severe diabetes and a heart condition. And he was facing what they thought could be immediate deportation. He had worked, he didn't have a traffic ticket, had paid his taxes all those years. So after 25 years, they were gonna take him. And I just joined other religious leaders uh, from other Christian churches, from uh, Muslim communities and Jewish communities and w simply to walk with him and to, uh, I think, show that he was not alone, but also to the best of our ability, show his face, his real face. And I suppose the conviction about the face that you know, began for me years ago, I, I have eight, you know, I have 12 siblings and eight of them are girls and they're very smart and very assertive, and I could show you scars, but um, <laughs> one, of the, one of them, is, who's a federal judge, uh, now did her undergrad in history. So I used to steal her books when she'd come home, when I was home on vacation and, and read them. And she had a very interesting one on some of the ethical dimensions of World War II. And she, in this, I'll never forget this article on Allied bombing policy. The, Allies, when we, and especially the Americans, when we entered the war in, in late 1941, had a very strict criteria about who we would bomb. It would be absolutely only military targets. That changed, and we began to, be, to bomb civilian areas. What the author pointed out was at the time that that policy changed, the propaganda had to change and work very hard to objectify the Germans and Japanese as something less than human. Because, you know, call me Pollyannish, but I think even in our flawed state, if we recognize the humanity of another person, it makes it much more difficult to act inhumanely. So whether we're talking about the political rhetoric that calls people names, horrible names, or even the sort of political thought that simply speaks of statistics. You know, I, I like what Mark Twain said, that there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, damned lies, and statistics. <laughs> and, and I think to everybody here in the soft sciences, it's not simply that their reading can be ambiguous or they can be manipulated. But I think if you're talking about human beings, the the, the, the risk is of reducing people to simply statistics. When you do that, then you can do less than human things to them. Here, we don't refer to statistics, we refer to data. Yeah. 
Uh, it's much better. Uh, you, you not only have gone from these experience uh, with the governor and with deportation, you and the bishops have actively, but respectfully, but clearly opposed the policies of this administration, the so-called Muslim ban, the removing the temporary deported uh, de uh, status for Salvadorans, Nicaraguans, Haitians, uh, DACA, uh, the, what they call chain migration, what you call family uni unification. Uh, why and how do you step over welcoming the stranger to uh, these policies are not the right policies, and frankly, the demonization of rhetorics of, of immigrants and refugees is not an abstraction. It comes from a particular place. Uh, the, uh, when, when they talk about countries and names we can't say in chapel, those are places you've been. Why do you move from general avoid good, avoid evil, do good, welcome the stranger to the Muslim ban is wrong. We gotta have a DACA solution. Uh, the Haitians and Salvadorans and Nicaraguans who are here deserve a place. How, why do you, and how do you cross that line and how do you explain that to legislators, policy makers, and ordinary citizens? Well, I think that one of the absolute purposes, or if you will, of, of, of faith is to reduce fear. That, you know, uh, there's that old adage, if you, if you trust God, then why be afraid? Now, I don't think I would advocate a sort of political naivete, but I do believe that people are aware of how the world changes and it frightens them, and a 24-7 news cycle enhances that fear to keep you coming back, because you'll have a, a better chance of turning on your TV if you're afraid. And so um, I think that, you know, not simply out of justice for the people who are being treated inhumanely, but to free people who feel secure in this country, at least that we have a paper that says so, but are in fact victims of fear and are being manipulated. Um, it's, for me, it probably has something to do with this experience of globalization. And I find it very interesting that possibly the most nefarious feature of globalization you can't see. Things like massive currency transfers, or manipulation of markets. You can't see that. But what you can see are these poor people who have come from another place. And they must be the reason why uh, my life isn't, isn't happy or, or because I'm afraid. I don't think it's true. And so we're trying to say that. Aren't, aren't some of the fears uh, justified, uh, not in a moral sense, but there are parts of this country where workers have had stagnant wages and some would claim immigrants have something to do with that. You spoke earlier about how the broader economic divisions exacerbate that fear. Yeah. The, there are two different questions there. The one mm -hmm. question is, are wages stagnant? Absolutely, you know, and I think that uh, people are being encouraged to accept, uh, and not simply immigrants, uh, a substandard uh, w living because of some economic policies that really have nothing to do with immigration. Uh, my experience is a lot of the work that immigrants are doing, a lot of the people don't really want to do. There was a, uh, a sort of satirical film out, oh gosh, it's got to be now 10, 15 years ago, called A Day Without Mexicans. Mm -hmm. You might remember it. And it's where there's this sort of rapture experience in California where all the Mex Mexicans disappear. And there's a, you know, a, a, uh, a convertible with Our Lady of Guadalupe in the front going down with uh, the horn playing the cucaracha and there's nobody in it. They're all gone. 
and very quickly the economic life of uh, California falls apart. Mm -hmm. I think you can make the same argument with the garment industry and slaughterhouses and uh, other portions. So I think it's a bogus argument uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, that immigrants are, I mean, are, are uh, taking jobs from other people, but it's one that plays to people's fears. At a place like Georgetown, we celebrate the remarkable leadership achievement uh, uh, of DACA students who've come to us. We probably don't pay enough attention to the people all around us who don't have that status, but who, who clean the classrooms and work in the, what do we call the cafeteria now, dining hall? Leo's, I guess. I mean, one of the challenges I've always found in Washington was your point that if you're willing to make your own bed when you go to a hotel, wash your own dishes and take care of your own children and mow your own lawn, maybe uh, you could go down that road. Let me push back a little bit. And uh, there are some Catholics who say uh, this is all very interesting, but you have the wrong priorities. There are more important issues, more fundamental issues of life and death. And then there are some who are even more direct. Steve Bannon, uh, formerly of the administration, a Catholic, he says, said quite bluntly, the reason why the Catholic Church supports immigrants is because white people are not going to church as much as they used to. Yeah. He, uh, some people have said the reason we support refugees is because we have these programs, the Archdiocese of Indianapolis gets money to resettle that family. Uh, I'm being blunt here, but uh, how would you respond to those? Well, I would respectfully disagree, and I would. <laughs> <laughs> I am stunned. <laughs> and I would say to someone like Mr. Bannon, uh, what Ambrose Bierce said about Americans in general in the mid 19th century, he said, war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. In other words, that if it isn't a tragic uh, circumstance like war, Americans can be oblivious, and I'm one of them, can be oblivious of what happens around the world. Around the world, the Catholic Church is welcoming refugees. And they're welcoming in, in places where arguably the, the uh, pews are full. And not simply the Catholic Church. I mean, I. I would point to a country like Lebanon that has, I believe, about four million residents plus two million re refugees because they're right at the heart of the violence of the Middle East. Now, this, they, Greece, countries that have very small or uh, much weaker resources than the United States have, welcome these people and do their best to help them. Mm -hmm. And it just says, if you live in other countries and return to the United States, you cannot help but be, be impressed by the hardness of heart that is becoming ever more manifest in public discourse. Mm -hmm. I would invite our colleagues to come forward. Uh, while you talk about that, I mentioned my parish and you know the challenge we face, and it goes to this question of who goes to church and where vitality comes from. And we have a little parish in Prince George's County that is very diverse, and you know, first mass times change, and that creates problems in the parking lot. That's the ultimate crisis. Uh, for a parish, and one of our, one of my friends, an old Anglo like me, came up and said, what's happening to our parish? And uh, I said, well, it's being renewed. He said, what do you mean renewed? And I said, well, they seem to do a lot of baptisms and we seem to do a lot of funerals. <laughs> <laughs> We're not leaving, but we are a much more vital, alive community of faith. Uh, we, had, we had the Stations of the Cross, and it used to be inside and very reverent, and half of it was in Latin. And now our Latino parishioners march through the streets of our little town with the Stations of the Cross. 
and put up the, the three crucifixes. Linda, my wife, comes home and says, there are three people hanging on crosses in the front of the church. I said, Linda, it's Good Friday. <laughs> you know, that's what happened. So the vitality that you speak of is it. Speaking of the vitality, a good part of the vitality of the Georgetown community comes from our diversity, lots of different kinds of diversity, but especially from people like our next two guests. Miriam, uh, let me get this right. Uh, you were born in Mexico, your small town. Uh, Juventino Rosas, Guanajuato. Yeah. Uh, and you uh, came when you were two years old? I was four years old. Four years old to Austin. You grew up in Austin, and now you find uh, yourself at Georgetown. Uh, you're a sophomore. Uh, you are working to defend other DACA students. You're working in solidarity with uh, some of the workers' rights groups here at Georgetown. Uh, you're a policy intern at United We Dream. Uh, you're getting good grades. <laughs> uh, We've talked about the story of immigrants in the abstract. Share your journey with us. Um, yes. So hi, everyone. My name is Mizraim Belman Guerrero. And I was born in a small town in the state of Guanajuato in Mexico called Juventino Rosas. Uh, and I grew up there for the first four years of my life. Um, I grew up with my mom, my older brother, my grandparents. And my dad had been working in the U.S. Uh, for a couple of years now. I remember my mom telling me that uh, because my dad would spend so much time in the U.S. working and sending back money to us, that when he came to visit us when I was about two years old, I didn't know who he was. I did not want to hug him. I did not want to say hi to him because I really didn't know who this man was that just came into our lives for about a month and then left once again um, to the US. And so my parents began to see that that separation of our family uh, had started and we were growing up without a father. And so in 2003, around January 6th of 2003, my mom, older brother and I crossed uh, the border and without inspection and we then uh, got together with my dad in Austin, Texas. And since then, we grew up, uh, my older brother and I, uh, like any other American citizen uh, child would grow up. We went to school. I grew up in the public school system in Austin, Texas. I went there since pre-K to uh, my senior year of high school. And at first, I didn't realize what it meant to be undocumented and to grow up to be undocumented, growing up being undocumented uh, until 2011. Uh, back in 2011, my father was detained and put in deportation proceedings uh, following an incident where a coworker of his did not have a seatbelt on and they were stopped by the police, asked for documentation. And while my father did have a valid driver's license at the time and had the car under his name, uh, him and his co-workers were still all taken up uh, and ICE was called on them uh, to be, for them to be picked up and then taken to a detention center. Uh, and so my father was in a detention center for about a month in Pearsall Detention Center right outside of San Antonio. And again, I was growing up without a father. I did not know what to do. And my dad was the sole breadwinner in our family. And so I do not know how my mom made it through with bills, with food, but she got us through it. And unfortunately, during that same time period, my grandmother passed away back in Mexico. Uh, I had grown up with her for the first four years of my life, but now I was not able to say goodbye to her one last time because of my immigration status, because I, we knew that if we returned to pay our respects that we would not come back. And so my family made the tough decision of not returning uh, to Mexico when that happened. And we just kept fighting. We kept fighting for our place here in the United States. 
I began to get involved with an immigrant rights organization in 2013, uh, my sophomore year of high school. And that is really when I began to uh, kick off my experience with the immigrant rights community. I began to get involved with rallies, with marches, in any way that I could because I knew what happened to my family was really difficult on us. And I knew that that reality is someone not having their seatbelt away and being detained. And so I didn't want people to end up in a similar situation as mine. Uh, and so I continued to advocate. Uh, back in 2014, I, along with my brother, got the courage to speak up in front of uh, President Obama's speech in Austin, Texas, and we heckled him. Uh, and to our surprise, we did not get kicked out, but instead we were invited to speak with him backstage. Um, and so my brother and I, at the time, we were fighting for a protective status for parents of undocumented immigrants, like my mom and like my dad. And we were able to share with him our story <coughs> of what it meant to be an immigrant in the US with the fear of being in deportation proceedings, the fear of going back to a country that we did not really know and still don't know uh, very well. And I've continued my advocacy here once I got to Georgetown. It was an amazing opportunity that I did not expect once I got my acceptance letter. I cried. I did not know. It was my top choice. And so to of be able to. Of course it was your top <laughs> choice. <laughs> and so uh, coming from a small town where my parents didn't finish high school, where my grandparents to this day are, can't read or write, it has been truly really astonishing uh, and a pleasure to share the experience that I've had here at Georgetown with my parents, with my grandparents, letting them know that their sacrifices have been worth it and that we are still attempting to thrive here in the US. And so now I've continued to be involved with uh, Undocu Hoyas here on campus, with the Georgetown Solidarity Committee, with uh, Hoya Saxa Weekend, and various other organizations to really continue to fight for my community because mm -hmm. uh, it's not a battle yet won, but I know we're gonna get there. Mm. What, what more the, does it feel? Oh, everybody here is watching this debate unfold, if you can call it that. What's it like to be in the middle of that, not in terms of your politics or your hopes or fears, but your own life? I mean, how does it feel to be a political football? <laughs> doesn't feel good. <laughs> <laughs> and it is very scary. I know that uh, currently, while I am protected under DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, uh, once I enter into my senior year in 2019, I do not know if I will still have that protection. Um, my DACA work permit is set to expire in August of that year, and I don't I can't plan for a future with my degree mm -hmm. uh, because I really just don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know if going back to Austin, my parents will be detained because there have been increased raids in Austin as a retaliation for uh, the sanctuary city policies that have tried to be implemented in Austin. And I remember hearing my parents calling them and saying, hey, are you okay? Like, everything's happening. And my mom did not want to leave our apartment for several days after she started to first hear about reports of raids. And so I think for my life, it's just a whole lot of uncertainty. I don't know where uh, I'm gonna be in two, three years uh, down the road if nothing concrete is passed and so on. If this country finds a way, as it should, to recognize you, your family, and your contributions, what would you like to do after your Georgetown education? I, I think one of the first things I would love to do is to travel. I have not gotten to visit my hometown in 15 years now. 
Uh, unfortunately, two of my grandparents have now passed away, but I have two grandparents that I would love to visit and to really give them my Georgetown degree. This is for them. This is for their sacrifices. This is for my family. And to be able to really validate their sacrifices uh, would mean the world to me. I know that um, study abroad is something that everyone really like thinks about in college, but currently uh, that's not a reality for me. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be a great thing. Ms. Rim, thank you for sharing your powerful story. We'll Habon Ali is a, a senior, and she's also in graduate school, yes. doing two things at once. <laughs> uh, good luck with that. Uh, how does a young woman who grows up in Somalia uh, end up in Egan, Minnesota, and at Georgetown? What is your journey? You have been active in the Muslim Student Association here. You've been studying your heart out. <laughs> What, if, could you share some of your journey? Yeah, so um, I was actually born in Kenya. Oh, I'm sorry, but, I got um, that wrong. It's okay. Um, but as uh, coming from a single uh, family household, uh, my mom was not educated. Um, she never went to elementary school or any form of schooling. Um, and for her, her priority in her life was to educate specifically me, being her daughter, and my younger brother. And that meant doing anything possible. Um, scrubbing, as you said, your grandma scrubbed the floors in the hospitals. My mom did anything possible. Um, and in Kenya, the education systems, um, public schools are not necessarily you know, where you'd want your child to go, um, where there is no seating, there's you know, no windows, there's literally no space for even um, to have any form of education. So the only one that I could thrive in is a form of what we know now here as um, a, a semi-charter school, and that costs money. And for her, you know, she strived in that. And when we got the chance to come to the United States, you know, like we had that American dream, you know, that time where, um, you know, follow the yellow brick road, I guess you'd say. But when we came here, we realized that there is no social safety net for immigrants and refugees alike. Um, my mom had us, and she was in a new environment, in a new society, with no language basis, with no education, and no job. And that meant for a year and a half, we were living in people's houses. We were living with family relatives, we were living with different people who were also in the same circumstances. And after that process, we ended up becoming homeless. So in our, in our eyes, we came from poverty to poverty. And that, seeing my mom go through that, was one of the hardest things to witness as a nine-year-old, because I moved here when I was eight, in 2004. And that's three years after um, the impact of 9-11. And in the midst of everything, seeing her courageous and her strength and her faith in God, to be able to come to a country where She's already not validated as a, as, a, as a Muslim woman, but even then, there's a stigma against her. And to be able to strive and work against that. And we went into a shelter for a few months, and during that process, um, I learned that the only thing, and my mom will always tell me, that the only thing that anyone can, cannot take away from you is your education. And then that's the one thing that will save you and save us. And my journey to Georgetown is coming from that lens. Um, and it's, it's, it's bringing back what my mom sacrificed because it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's powerful. What is your experience? You know, there are different slices. You're very much a part of the Georgetown community. You're now part of a country that's having this incredibly polarized debate about your place and your place in our society. So you have some institutions that welcome you, mm -hmm. other institutions that, and leaders that seem to demonize you. Mm -hmm. The church is trying to stand up, other institutions are trying to stand up. 
what do you think our leaders ought to do and not do at this moment? And I want to include Cardinal Tobin in this question. Okay. Um, within the context of refugees and immigrants, specifically majority of refugees and immigrants today come from the Middle East or from um, parts of Somalia and other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think there needs to be a dialogue of, with, with, with the communities that are impacted. Um, not just for photoshops uh, where you just you know, have an immigrant next to you and you're like, vote for me um, and whatnot, but really engaging with them at a grassroots level um, and tr getting to know these immigrant communities, especially um, coming from Minnesota, there's a large Muslim um, immigrant community in Minneapolis and in St. Paul who don't have social network, um, who don't have social welfare. Um, and and that, that is a conversation that I think that our leaders needs to ha need to have. Um, what they shouldn't be doing um, is using human lives and human stories as, um, uh, as a form of fear and as a form of um, isolation. Uh, because every refugee and every immigrant is not a terrorist. Um, and um, they, they ran away from terror. Um, and, and using their stories um, is terrorizing them, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I think one thing that I would like to highlight is to stop looking for the perfect immigrant story. Uh, I think the immigrant experience is very broad and very complex. And while we are fortunate enough to have those immigrants that cure diseases, that do these things, there's a lot of immigrants that are, like my mom, that are here, hardworking, that don't go to school, aren't gonna be the ones on the front page mm -hmm. discovering something brand new that has never been brought to this world, but her life and her experience are just as valid and she deserves human dignity just like any of those immigrants. And so I think that is one thing that would be uh, a positive step for the conversation is to shift Mm -hmm. uh, to really be inclusive to all immigrant experience and to, um, and to really look for those that are um, also not at the most privileged positions. Mm -hmm. um, I think something, I guess the reverse of that would be to not uh, only uh, look for those perfect immigrants and to really uh, listen to everyone's story because everyone has a different story and everyone's everyone's story is just as valid. Um, and we really need to look at those with other marginalized identities because uh, it is difficult to uh, try to strive already as an immigrant, but if the conversation is only focused on Latinx immigrants and those resources are only going to that community, then there are a whole lot of Im other immigrants that are left out of the conversation and left out of those resources. Mm -hmm. To build on that, there's enormous pressure in order to get an agreement on DACA to sort of look beyond the claims and the rights and the dignity of other immigrants uh, from Central America uh, to uh, abandon family-based immigration for so-called merit-based immigration. How does the church try and keep these things together? Well, I'm not sure I can speak for the whole church. I might yeah. say, how do I try to keep it together? I think there, there are people in the public square today that are vaunting their proudness at making deals. And I think that... Uh, Anyone it, in particular? It, no, no. <laughs> but if we're gonna sign off on a deal, we, really, we better understand, you know, what's really being exchanged. Mm -hmm. uh, I fully support a, a clean DACA bill, and I, I think uh, any sort of tit-for-tat on this one is very dangerous, and it will... I think the, uh, the administration is, is certainly setting its eyes on bigger things. If you look at the budget proposals that are going to Congress. You look at the number of um, money that's gonna be invested. Now we all hear about the famous wall, but actually, at least in the, as I recall, the, the Border Patrol that actually works in that area 
is not being envisioned as, as expanding. Mm -hmm. It's ice that's being expanded. Mm -hmm. And ice can only work in the interior of the country, mm -hmm. away from the borders. If you look at the number of beds that are being uh, asked for in, in the budget projections, it may not look like a great number unless you factor those by 10, mm -hmm. saying that 10 people can sleep in that bed in the course of a year mm -hmm. because they're going to be moved on. So I, I think that uh, you know, there is um, a great cry in the, the, the debate these days to, you know, everybody has to compromise. <coughs> Well, I think that we should draw some, some line, lines in the sand. It's not being uh, stubborn for the sake of being stubborn, mm -hmm. but that we would be giving away uh, some you know, essential mm. hope for human beings. How about, and Ms. Rem, do you have a question for the Cardinal as we bring our uh, conversation to a close? Oh, okay. Um, one of my questions is, how can we integrate um, an allyship with other uh, faith groups or faith organizations um, in this fight for uh, especially DACA students and also um, immigrants and refugees? Thank you, Haman. Uh, the, I, I really think Pope Francis offers, and, and uh, Dr. Joya mentioned it in his introduction, this notion of a culture of encounter. Mm that we're not going to put down a whole lot of litmus tests before I decide whether we can talk. But that human beings, and especially people who are coming from a background of faith, mm -hmm. have very similar notions about what is good. And we meet each other doing good. And so I think that th that eagerness to go, you know, for us in the Christian community to go out of ourselves, mm -hmm. In, uh, in reaching out to our Muslim community or the Jewish community, or and yes, even the unbelieving people mm -hmm. or agnostic, and say, how can we meet each other doing good? To me, that, that will open new possibilities for us. And I think recognizing the face and the voice mm -hmm. of others, you know, for, for who they are. I... Uh, I used to work in a type of retreats that were called cursillos, they're little weekend retreats, and most of them were in Spanish, but I did one in English once, and there was an African-American guy on the team that was, we became good friends. His name, I can tell you his name, his name was Oliver Washington III, Ali, mm -hmm. to his friends. And Ali once said to me, uh, Joe, do you love me? And I said, yeah, I love you, Ali. He said, does my being black have anything to do with it? At the time, I thought uh, I gave the right answer. I said, oh, no, 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 I don't even see that. And Ali very kindly said, that's my point. <laughs> that's my point. So I think we meet each other doing good, recognizing the, the humanity and the particular gifts that make you, you, you know. But we can do good together. Thank you. Ms. Ruh? Um, so the church being a worldwide leader and uh, how do we begin those conversations with fellow parishioners that aren't as engaged or haven't had those experiences with migrants? Um, how does the church take those first yeah. steps in creating this dialogue? Well, I suppose there's a responsibility for people that do what I do to try and open the dialogue. Knowing that our silence isn't simply neutral but it's leaving a wide open forum for other voices that are being, that their people are gonna hear or read every day. Now ultimately it's gonna be up to you whether you think uh, what I say is true or not. But I think we have to speak on behalf and invite and say this isn't just uh, Joe Tobin's whimsy. This is what our faith is, is a, constituent element of our faith is justice, mm. the practice of justice. And so uh, I think one thing that, you know, the church is more than bishops. One thing bishops can do is begin the conversation and listen to people who are afraid or angry or determined. 
and continue the conversation after that. At the end of a powerful conversation like this, I think people are probably saying, uh, what can I do? I'm a student, I'm a member of the faculty, I'm a community leader, I'm an interested parishioner, uh, I'm a citizen, I'm not a citizen. Uh, could you close with uh, something specific that each of us could do to express our solidarity with the stories that we've heard, to lift up the values that you've described, to protect human lives and dignity at a time of great fear, uncertainty, and uh, even danger? Well, I would say for the citizens here, um, you know, a, a very practical uh, step would be to call the, the senators from your state, as well as your representative, and advocate for a clean DACA act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just say that the, you, you don't compromise on that. That's in the short term, knowing that there, there are other things that are coming down the pike. But I think that, you know, uh, it would be particularly tragic, you know, listening to, to people who are most affected by that legislation or the lack of it. I think if I was an undocumented person, what I would ask is, you know, to not cower before this terrible threat, to let people of good faith know who you are, mm -hmm. that you're not simply a statistic, that you have a story. And I like what Ms. Rahim said, it's not always a perfect story. I mean, who's, who's got, whoever's got a perfect story here uh, uh, can stay afterwards and tell it. But uh, <laughs> none, of us, none of us have uh, a perfect story. But I can understand how when you, you, know, you feel like you're in the spotlight, you think that's what's being required of you. Mm -hmm. And that's not a human existence. So I think for the undocumented, it would be just to, yeah, to go out of yourself in reaching out to to people of good faith to say who you are. Mitchum? I think one thing that is beneficial to all of us in these times is really just being informed, staying involved, staying active, listening to what is happening nationally, locally, uh, looking at policies that come, up, uh, come about, uh, really getting to know uh, the stories, but also the policies that are affecting the community. Um, you know, it's important to understand that um, there are bills that are coming forward uh, to protect the immigrant community, but there are also uh, different ways that communities are being targeted locally mm. with 287G contracts or with secure communities. And if people don't know what those things are, I would encourage you to look them up because these are things that affect the immigrant community every day. And if you aren't aware of these <laughs> issues, then uh, it's not a, it's best to come into the conversation at, uh, with a good knowledge of what's happening and a good understanding of what affects immigrants' lives day to day. Come on. I would say, uh what both of you said was excellent. Um, but in addition, I think we live in a society of very fast gratification. <coughs> so if we see something happen um, that impacts a certain group of people, we post about it um, for my generation specifically, or we just you know, uh, do things that are not necessarily effective in the long run, I would say that in one way we can try to mobilize empathy um, at the local level truly try to get to know the immigrants in your communities, in your churches, in your mosques, in your synagogues, um, and, and even the refugees and the DACA's uh, students as well. Because um, that's the only way, if you have a story to th this situation, you'll be able to actually mobilize yourself and feel like you're a part of that as well. So. Before I ask you to uh, thank uh, our powerful presenters for sharing their journey, want to call attention to a couple upcoming uh, conversations that may be of interest to people. On February 13th, so a week from tomorrow, the initiative is uh, hosting 
a session on the Francis factor at five years. We're approaching five years since the election of Pope Francis. And we're deeply honored to have Father Anthony Spadaro, a Jesuit, very close, confident advisor to Pope Francis and editor of the major Jesuit publication from the Vatican to talk about Pope Francis' global vision. And then we have a conversation among uh, uh, Kristen Powers, Kirsten Powers from, Catholic, uh, from CNN, uh, Greg Erlinson, who's the editor-in-chief of Catholic News Service, and Sister Norma Pimentel, who is doing remarkable work on the U.S.-Mexican border on the issues we've described. So that is Tuesday, February 13th at 6 p.m. in Gaston. And then our colleagues in Mission and Ministry are having Greg Boyle on February 27th at 7 p.m. here in the chapel. If you've never heard Father Boyle talk about his work, uh, you're missing something important. Uh, I would like to thank all those who made uh, this Dahlgren Dialogue possible, especially our colleagues in Mission and Ministry, uh, Father Mark, uh, Kate, and uh, Jim. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Monica and Angela and our students, but I, and I want to thank uh, President DeJoya for his tremendous support of our work but also the Dahlgren Dialogues by his presence and by his passion. Georgetown is serious about this issue, makes you proud to be a part of this community. And I would ask you to join me in thanking these powerful voices. We would like to end our evening with uh, some petitions that will be read as our closing prayer and perhaps our rousing song to kind of bring us back into the world so that we can do the good work that um, we are called to do. So I invite uh, Jacqueline Martinez to come forward. Please stand. Oremos por un mundo mejor, en donde la amenaza de la violencia, el hambre y la falta de esperanza no nos alejen de nuestras familias, de los lugares que llamamos hogar y de las personas que nos aman. Let us pray for our world, that the threat of violence, famine, and lack of hope should no longer drive families from the places they call home and the people who love them. We pray to the Lord. Por un país que eventualmente se dará cuenta de la plenitud de su promesa como un refugio para los amenazados, los olvidados y los desechados. Celebremos la inmensidad de la herencia duradera de los inmigrantes que tanto han aportado a su grandeza. For our country, that it will realize the fullness of its promise as a refuge for the threatened, the forgotten, and the cast aside and that we celebrate the immensity of the lasting heritage of the immigrants who contributed so much. We pray to the Lord. Lord our Oremos por los niños y los padres que perdieron sus vidas huyendo de sus países de origen, porque sus almas encontraron, para que sus almas encuentren consuelo eterno en los brazos del Señor. For the children and parents who lost their lives fleeing their home countries, that their souls should find everlasting comfort and peace in your blessed arms of mercy. We pray to the Lord. Por los jóvenes indocumentados que siendo niños fueron traídos aquí, han crecido y tenido éxito. Para quienes este gran país es el único hogar que conocen y para ser posible que ya no vivan con el temor de que les quiten sus vidas y su esperanza. For the undocumented children brought to this country who have grown and succeeded here. 
and for whom this is their only home, that they may no longer live in fear of having their dreams and hopes taken from them. We pray to the Lord. Por nuestra comunidad, que Georgetown viva en su más profundo en su compromiso de ser gente de los demás y que salga en defensa de los amenazados y oprimidos por nuestra para nuestra sociedad, reconociendo que incluso entre nosotros hay quienes viven con miedo y aislados. Let us pray for this community, that Georgetown live into the depths of its commitment to be people for others and come to the defense of those threatened and oppressed by our society, recognizing that even amongst us, there are those who live in fear and isolation. We pray to the Lord. Lord Let us pray. God of all, we lift our prayers to you with grateful hearts. Remind us again of our own pilgrim journey and kindle in us the passion and determination for a wider and more just hospitality. Aware your blessings, we pray that our words and deeds may express the wideness of your family and the breadth of your merciful embrace. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Please join us in singing, O God of Every Nation, found in your program, verses 1, 2, and 3. Thank you very much, and all are welcome to join us in Riggs Library for a reception following this. Thank you. <laughs> 